You are listening to the Regeneration Rising podcast, a podcast from the Kavira Coalition about the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of agrarians in the United States. Each episode will explore what it means to work in regenerative agriculture, how people came to choose this as their livelihood, and why it's important to them and the future. We hope to build a foundation for a strong community of future agrarians and land stewards with a regenerative approach to community, relationships, and the land. Welcome back to another episode of Regeneration Rising. I'm Taylor Mulia, and today we have a very special episode for you. Thanks to the Colorado Department of Agriculture's Next Gen Ag Leadership Grant, we have invited some alumni of the New Agrarian Program to help us out with the podcast. So today's episode is guest hosted by Natalie Berkman. She is the VP of Operations at Oxbow Cattle Company, and she just so happens to be interviewing another alumni of the program, Susan Elder, who who is the assistant manager and cattle division manager at 4L Grazing in Beaumont, Kansas. We are so excited to have these two on the podcast, and I can't wait for everyone to hear this conversation. But first, really quickly, I also wanted to plug, we have a lot of programming going on for alumni and other beginning agrarians. So currently we are running a webinar series called the New Agrarian Toolkit Series, and it includes topics such as small ruminant grazing, but also team management and launching a new enterprise and telling your story and dealing with mental health and agriculture. It should be a really amazing series. So I thought a lot of our listeners would enjoy that. So if you'd like to find out more information and register for those webinars, uh, you can find it at kiviracoalition.org slash toolkit. Okay, I'm done. I'll let Natalie take over. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy. Natalie and Susan, thank you so much for being on our podcast today. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting us on here. Yeah, happy to be here. So, uh, Natalie, this is our first time guest hosting a podcast. Uh, Why don't you start out by telling us First, maybe briefly a little bit about yourself and why you chose Susan to interview today. So I was a Kavira apprentice um, in the new agrarian program for two years. I worked at the Milton Ranch outside of Roundup, Montana. Um, And now I am starting my second year here at Oxbow Cattle Company outside of Missoula, Montana. Um, And when when you asked me to co-host this podcast with you, Taylor, um, I was just thinking of all the awesome people that I could talk to and ask to interview. And then I kind of thought about what, what I wanted to talk about and what kind of podcasts that I like to listen to. And that is definitely um, someone who is kind of in the exact same space as me, a young person working and ranching, kind of doing the everyday day to day cow work. Um, Cause I don't, I don't really hear a lot of podcasts interviewing people um, like that, young people like me who are just kind of like going for it. And I love Susan and she's out there doing really awesome work in Kansas. So I thought she would be perfect to interview. Awesome. Let's jump in. Do you want to start with your first question? Yeah. So, so we haven't really caught up in a while just because we're both really busy ranching and everything that goes into that. So um, do you want to tell me and I guess everyone else listening about your position and the operation you work on? Yeah, I'll just say before I start out, uh, Natalie and I haven't talked in quite some time. And so I've just been really looking forward to this just to catch up if nothing else. So yeah, super happy to be here. I'm working right now out in um, Beaumont, Kansas, where the ranch I work on is uh, 7,000 acres of tall grass prairie it was settled by the Farrell family. Um, so Pete Farrell is, um, he owns the land I work on and I work for the a management company called 4L Grazing. And so, you know, Pete owns the land and then I work for the management company and I work for a man named John, John Wagner, who just recently actually purchased the management company. 
Um, and so I'm the foreman of the management company. So I kind of have to like keep those two separate, like the land base and the management company. That's like very intentional. Yeah. So that's, that's my position and we're Flint Hills. It's just like a really amazing ecosystem that I work in. Tallgrass Prairie is super unique. Um, I grew up in Kansas, so I know like I know this ecosystem or I grew up around it. But it's been just like such a such a beautiful opportunity to be able to really get to know this place that I grew up. You know, I grew up seeing it and getting to know it some in the ways I could as a kid um, and interacted with it some, but now really working with it has been such a cool opportunity. So Susan, I feel like you're, you sound, you sound more Kansas-y than when I last talked to you in Montana. What? <laughs> like, what I don't know. You sound Kansas-y. Just like a bit of a Kansas accent. You're just, you're just They're a little more twang. The, yeah. You return to the tall grass prairie and, and it's, <laughs> it sounds like it. I spend more time around my dad. He's a Southerner. Um, I'm picking up on the little twang thing again. <laughs> oh, you sound the same awesome. as you always have. <laughs> So can you can you explain kind of your job as a foreman and what that looks like every day? Yeah, so I mean, I'm basically the get get her done person, you know. John sets the big picture. He's the guy that's, you know, behind the curtain making all the plans and looking really far into the future and making bigger decisions and I'm the one that goes and basically gets the day done. And you know, with with the help of a lot of other people, not a lot of other people, but a good team of people that we have on the ranch right now. So I'm working with, um, currently we have two Peruvian men that herd our small ruminant herds. So we have a herd of around 1,200 goats, um, meat goats, and around 900 hair sheep. And I don't, I don't actively manage those very much. I, I just kind of assist. We have a small ruminant manager, Katie, um, who was an apprentice at the ranch for a while. So she's like directly manages those. And I just kind of provide her assistance. And the, I do the same for these Peruvian guys that are, you know, they're the ones that really live with the herds and take care of them. You know, we don't, you can't keep those, that many animals in fences, <laughs> especially the small ones. So we're just kind of herding them around. I help them get their jobs done. And then I'm the cow-calf manager, and I also manage our stalker herds. So most of my days are with cattle. So I'm, you know, I'm doing a lot of the stuff we learned how to do in our apprenticeship. I'm moving them around, making sure everyone's got, got enough grass, got enough water, doing grazing plans. And constantly touching base with John to make sure that our days, you know, the day's work is aligning with kind of the bigger picture and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, that's like a kind of an overview maybe of what my days look like. But what do your days look like right now? Our days never really look the same, which is kind of fun and different from my apprenticeship. So I think most of the reason for that is because we also have a beef business So it's like running two businesses, which, yeah, which is a lot. But right now we still have a bunch of snow on the ground. Like it just refuses to melt. And so we, and, but we have all the stockpiled grass underneath. So like, we don't want to like waste the stockpiled feed. So we are, I mean, we spread the hay out on, um, like we never feed hay on top of itself. We always spread it over the snow, but we try to do it like systematically. So like as soon as the snow melts, we can just start to go to daily moves because that's kind of what like the whole point of all the stockpile feed is for. So it's kind of a bummer to still be full feeding. And because we start like this snow fell in the beginning of November and then it just was like cold and cold and just snowed a bunch November and December and just hasn't gone away it's so this is like a winter from hell it's so bad it's so bad and then it's just supposed to be like a cold and dry spring which is horrible oh that's rough yeah we had we've been I don't know we've just been waiting on water here like we had a really dry summer last year and like all of our stock ponds are 
probably, you know, some of the best ones are halfway full. <laughs> and oh gosh, you know, and this it's just been so bad. And and then this is the time of the year when the rain is supposed to come historically. But um, so Pete, um, who owns the land I work on, he's been really good at tracking like historic rainfall events over the past like 30 years. And he's just been watching this trend in our area of the spring rains coming later and later and later. And so like, traditionally in this landscape for us to get enough rain to really have good healthy tall grass prairie like you you need the rains like now like march april but now the rains are coming more in like may june like much later and it's just it's hard to support the growth of these like warm season grasses that thrive in this ecosystem and it's just kind of scary cuz especially right now we just we need we need water just to like water the animals and we're supposed to be like bringing in a bunch of other people's animals here because, you know, in this country, they, you know, like a huge flush of warm season grasses. Folks in this area will just ship in a bunch of animals to take advantage of that big flush of growth and then you'll ship them away. But if we don't get if we don't get the water in our ponds and uh, we just can't support we can't support the animals that are like. I mean, that's like how we cash flow the business. It's a huge part of what makes our business work. I don't know. It's a little scary for sure. Wow. So you is that your custom grazing part of the enterprise? Yeah. So we last summer we brought in, I think it was around 1,700 stalkers. So uh, like growing, you know, yearling animals. And they come in for like three, four, five months sometimes. And we'll, you know, we'll just rotate them around, get them fat and happy, and then ship them along their way. So yeah, they'll come in May typically, but you have to, you have to contractually, like a lot of these folks that own these young animals and, you know, are looking for places to send them for the summer months. Like we have to tell them by April 10th, if we have enough water. And we don't get water in April very, you know, we don't get enough water in the early months right now, or that's how it seems to be trending with like how the rainfall has been acting in the past, you know, decade or so. And with a big drought, like we had last year, we just might not be able to like make up the difference to have enough water to really like follow through on these contracts and bring everyone's animals on. So I don't know, it's kind of tenuous, but what is your involvement in those kind of decisions? Not very involved, honestly. I'm very peripheral to them, which is like appropriate at this point in my career. Like I wouldn't know how to make those decisions. It's cool to be able to like peek over John's shoulder as he as he's like wheeling and dealing and making the contract, you know, just getting all the big picture stuff lined out. He's really open with me about those decisions and and Pete is involved on making some of those bigger decisions too, because he's the CFO of the business. So, but they're both super inclusive about, you know, showing me the the why. And John, John often wants to, you know, have conversation about it. But at the end of the day, you know, he's the one who makes those calls. How is that for you, Natalie, with some of like the bigger picture things going on at Oxbow? Or do you feel like you get to be involved? Yeah, definitely. I'm kind of like transitioning into more to being more involved in those decisions and like I what I'm trying to I guess what I think I should be doing and (laughs) I'm trying to do is to like be proactive about stuff like that and not just kind of like react to decisions that Bart and Wendy make and said be like hey maybe we should look for more grass somewhere else or hey we're this is the forecast I looked at it's not looking good for melting snow we're going to need more hay instead of just like kind of waiting, just being like, Hey, there's one bale left in the hay yard. But then having that in the back of my mind while also like, I mean, I'm still pretty new to ranching. So still kind of like being in charge of the day to day, like you were saying, getting stuff done, you know, like balancing all of that with also kind of like the big picture stuff um, is something I'm trying to work on. And then I'll, and then I guess I want to get into like how your apprenticeship was different than what you're doing now. And like, for me, the biggest thing is that we, we have all these different leases 
here at Oxbow. And so I'm just like cows are kind of all over the valley. And I spent a lot of time like kind of going all over the place. And then so therefore we spent a lot of time moving cows, whether on trailing them horseback or trailering them down. So that's like that's like a whole nother world of ranching. But what are the biggest differences in your job now? And I guess the environment in which you work and the responsibilities you have and what you were doing um, with Steve Charter. So with Steve, we were managing like, um, it was, it was a residential herd, you know, it was a home herd and, you know, he, he'd throw some new cows in there every now and again, but mostly it was a group of cows that I just got to know really well. And here it's been quite different because I've been asked to manage. So one of the first enterprises I was asked to manage was a short-term cow operation. So we were just, we bought a bunch of discounted cows. We were going to, our plan was to calve them out and then sell the cow. So it was like a really quick turnaround thing. It ended up being uh, quite traumatic for everyone. Like there was a lot of death loss and we got, we just had, it was a hard it was a hard thing. And it was kind of a, people will tell you, I feel like, and John will say, you know, he, he was the one who really wanted to do this. He thought we could make some good money doing it, but to do a short-term cow operation well, it takes a lot of trial and error, I think. And uh, you have to really have some good patterns and it was our first year doing it and we were just bound to fail quite a bit. And it was my first year managing (laughs) anything. And I'm just watching these cows die right and left. And I'm just like, what the hell is wrong with me? I'm not cut out for this. Like all I do is just, you know, I couldn't, it was, it was a lot, but I mean, turns out we just like made a bad call on a lot of things, but anyways, so I did that short term cow deal and then I was managing stalkers. So they come in and then they go. So I didn't really like get to know the animals in the same way. And and you really, I don't know, you, it, it, you don't think about that as much when you're just around the animal all the time. You don't think about how, how much you rely on that relationship. Like they really get to know you, they get to know you have a certain way of communicating with them and they become accustomed to it. And you have these patterns that you develop. And, and these cert, like little attachments that you form and relationships that you form with certain cattle. And I just haven't, I haven't had that in the same way. And it's been, it's been interesting. I, I kind of miss having, I miss having like the kind of the home cow herd in some ways. Um, but I feel like it's, it's all, it's asked me to get a lot better at like my stockmanship it's asked me to get a lot better at like learning how to actually communicate with these animals and how to ask what I need of them because I'm, I'm introducing myself over and over and over to a bunch of new animals. And like, I have to get really good and really clear on my end to make sure that, you know, even if they only see me for a short amount of time and a, you know, a few times a week, um, I have to be super clear in order to get the job done. And so, I don't know, it's just asked a lot more of me in that way, which has been so fun because I've grown a lot um, in that transition. I think that's been like one of the main like changes as far as like the cows go. And then obviously going from short grass prairie in Montana in that arid country to this lush tall grass ecosystem with, you know, 30 plus inches of rain a year. It's, it's crazy. It's a very, it was a very stark transition. I mean, it's, it's so cool to talk to people who are running cows and like, cause I don't, I don't really have a concept of what other ranches look like outside of Montana, you know? And so when you like here, we run on a, like a little bit less than, you guys there but you're talking like spring 1700 stalkers I'm like whoa that really spells things out for me and that gives me like a very not a very but a clearer picture of what it looks like there like there is a whole lot of grass so in a good year we can harvest like 70 SDAs per acre that's awesome um so that's you're like coming back to it but you know after recovery but 
I mean, and, and last year was a hard year. It was hot. It was a lot. But when it's good, it's like real good. And you have to be ready to catch. You have to be ready to like catch the value. And that's something I wasn't really ready for is like how quickly you have to like move the animals and be thinking about really harvesting the grass when it's good. Because because when it's bad, it's really bad. Like it loses its quality almost entirely in the wintertime. And we have to do a lot of supplementing, which is another totally different thing that I like we have, a you know, a, a big feed truck with a hopper on it. And you got to go and make sure they've got plenty of protein in front of them and we'll cube them. And and we just didn't have to think about that because the grass held its quality where we were managing when we were learning in Montana. And yeah, it's. So learning how to like graze fast when the growth is fast and keep up with that has been challenging. You got to get pretty crafty with your ability to move the animals and to, you know, know exactly how many animals need to go on a certain amount of acreage. And yeah. um, Yeah. Are you doing a lot of, of that intensive grazing, like poly wire stuff out there? Yeah, we are right now. Not so much like in the dormant season, not as much. But when the grass really starts growing, we we manage them a lot in poly wire and try to get really good density. Right, right now, just like looking into the summer and what it's going to look like, our challenge is it's going to be it's going to be water because we usually have a lot of like really good creeks I mean they're seasonal creeks but in the summertime they're full and we've got good draw water and stuff like that and we're probably just not going to have that this year in the same way and uh, it'll create a lot of challenges for making our grazing really what we'd like it to be but is that for for y'all Natalie are you guys trying to really accomplish some high intensity grazing yeah definitely it's all dependent on surface water or that's kind of where we water our cows for the most part and which is different from bill and dana's because they had like this whole developed pipeline system with like beautiful water tanks all over the freaking ranch and like last summer or last spring was really cold and dry so like these creeks that we rely on to water cows out of just like wouldn't run and so I mean, it's kind of the same situation where it's one of those things that's kind of scary and bad. But like for me, being someone new to this and is just like hungry for new skills, like so basically I like animals had two days on this tank because it was like spring fed and the spring was just like trip, trip. And it, it would hold that herd for two days. And then I had to move them over to another pasture, like where there's where the creek was running. And so like every two days I would have to go like gather everything and then push them to the, this other pasture. And it wasn't that far away, but like there was different ways to go. And like, you could go kind of the easy way, or you could kind of go where there wasn't fences and there was like a hill mountain, whatever. And so I would just like, kind of this, this was over like three weeks. And I would just kind of every two days I would like pick different routes to take and like, use my dog a lot and like Nell and I just got like so good at like she would be in the back and I would kind of be in the front when we went this one route and then and then like I got kind of confident because I was still getting used to Bart Wendy's cows I didn't really know them I didn't really know like how to work them that well and then like as I was getting comfortable doing that one route like then I just decided to go like this this the scarier route where there wasn't really fences and there and that was just like so fun. And um, I mean, looking, I'm really excited for this summer because like, I know the ranch so much better and I kind of like, I know those roots and I have walked a vast majority of the ranch and I know the cows and my dog is up to shape. So yeah, I'm just excited to see what's going to happen this year. That's so cool. What you're saying about just getting to know a ranch and just getting to know a place it it takes a good full year just to get to know like where all the damn gates are (laughs) there's so many things to learn and and especially when you're like learning how to how the the animals and and the infrastructure interact too like so getting to know the animal getting to know the infrastructure getting to know how the grass grows like there's just so much that goes that goes into getting to know a new place and that's it's hard work (laughs) 
there's so many kind of like oopsies or like mistakes that I made this year. Like, and I try to put myself like in the shoes of Bart and Wendy and like, cause they know the, they know their ranch like really well. And they know like where the high tensile runs along the exclosure and where it connects and like what kind of corners that the cows will rub, rub the insulators off. And like, there's just been so many things that I've done that I'm like, Oh, like, why didn't I have like a bigger picture, bigger understanding of like the landscape or where that freaking corner was or where that gate was? Because like looking at and then and I, I just didn't think about it like I should have. Or like you're like s- screaming at the cows, like, why the hell won't you go through that gate? And then you realize like, oh, it's because there's like a cliff on the other side, like and you think it's them. But then you're like, oh, maybe I just need I need to do a little more homework. <laughs> But it takes it takes messing up though. It all like literally like it always takes messing up once or twice or three times <laughs> for me to like just realize you just you just learn the lesson of why why the why the animal is doing it a certain way because they're never gonna lie to you. That was like one, that was one of the things. Uh, wasn't Whit Hibbard? He said that. Or maybe it was a Bud Williams thing, but they never, they're never going to lie. And so like just watching them interact with it, you're like, oh, okay. Well, they're just, they're telling some truth about what's, what's going on out there. And we just got to be there to like, see it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That is so true. Cause like you definitely have went from like one environment to a different extreme environment, but even going from like the central plains to like over here in the mountains, there first of all all summer we're in this like very thick tree river bottom so it's like moving cows and trees is just a whole nother adventure that I had no because you physically cannot be in the place that you need to be in because there's a tree in the way or like you're on horseback and you kind of have to like follow right behind the animal a lot and you can't kind of like go out to the side so that's a whole nother environment and then I get lost because I don't know where I am. And there's like no, um, there's no way to like, gra- yeah, there's not like mountains are west. It's like, there's just trees everywhere. I don't know where I am. And then there's like really steep hills and mountains. And like, I don't know, like a lot of times when I was moving cows in that country, like I didn't know the best way to go or the b- way they wanted to go. So me and Nell will just like start moving thing or getting things up and like whichever way they went, I'm like, sure this is not the most direct route whatever but like I'm following you guys you show me around because I'm new here that's the I mean that's one of the blessings of having a home herd so we had we mixed in we have a small herd of like home raised cows that are still on the ranch and we uh, we plugged them in with those short-term cows when we had them and it was remarkable when I went out to move them, like the the way, like how efficient having those girls that just knew the pastures, knew the gates, they they made my job exponentially easier because I just I, I would, you know, you'd ask for a little while and they they'd get the idea so much faster. And then all the girls that didn't know the paddock as well would be like, oh, OK, this is a good idea, I guess. But that it's it's amazing when you can. Yeah, when you can just like let them lead the way a little bit that way. Yeah, or I mean, what you're saying about those um, stalkers that you like, you they have to rely on you for knowledge, and that's right. That's really and that's cool. scary. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's cool and fun. Some days, yeah. <laughs> other days, it's like I don't even know how to ask this of y'all. Yeah, but it's it's a good challenge yeah. for sure. How has the transition been um, like? with your team dynamics and working for different people. Cause I feel like that kind of takes a lot of emotional energy to not only like switch locations and switch jobs and learn all these new skills, but also have a whole new team. My first introduction to the 4L team was Katie Roberts. I got to know her at the Quivira Regenerate Conference. And that was I guess that would have been two years ago now, a year and a half now. But Katie was, you know, she's around our age, another young woman in agriculture, and she was apprenticing at the ranch. And she was just so warm and open. And, you know, getting to know her 
just that first time at Regenerate, I knew I was currently applying for the job when we got to know each other. And I just knew like, if she's, if she's there and she loves being there and she's the kind of person she is, I know I can make this work. That was just like a good omen for sure. <laughs> and it, and it turned out to be quite true. I, I just, I love the people that are here. It's one thing to like love the people and to get to know them. It's another thing to learn how to work beside them. And that was, that was a big challenge for me, especially because, you know, I came in and in my position, I was supposed to be, I was supposed to be Katie's boss. You know, I was supposed to be, you know, in charge of the apprentices or at least be the one that like could set the day and, you know, line out the day and help everyone get it done and stuff. And it was, it just was not that way when I first showed up because Katie knew the ranch better than I did. And her partner, Ethan knew the ranch better than I did. And the other apprentice at the ranch was John, my manager's wife. And so she knew the ranch better than I did. (laughs) And so I, you know, the dynamic off the bat was very much like, I'm, you know, I'm walking into this position of, I've I've been given an authority or a title, but I know I need you to teach me. (laughs) I need you to teach me. And so from off the bat, like, because I had to have that approach to like, our working dynamic, I had to be a learner, even though I was supposed to be in a position of, like, authority it made everything super approachable. It made everything very relational and good. And I've been able to be just friends with those people. John Wagner, my manager, I think when I, I really respect him, he is one of the more impressive people in agriculture I've ever encountered. He's like some, (laughs) I met some guy at Ranching for Profit that knew him and he said, he he's a near near genius like he is just like one of the smartest people i've ever been around he's uh, and so I, I i look up to him so much and so honestly like the relationship with him like it's been hard to become friends because i look up to him so much and so i think but we i feel like after a year of working beside each other we've we've learned how to you know we've learned to have mutual trust and respect and and we're we're becoming friends for sure. <laughs> he called me his friend the other day. <laughs> he said it out loud. Um, it's crazy. He said the F word. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, but it you know it's taken time. But with Pete, uh, the Pete Farrell is one of like the warmest men I've ever met. He's like so such a cheerleader and so kind. And his his wife. K is the same way and they're always welcoming you into their home and they want you to you know they want they want to know you and they want you to feel loved and taken care of and you know I think it was really easy to become everyone's friend besides John it wasn't super easy to become John's friend that took time (laughs) and I'm not afraid of him hearing that he he knows (laughs) he knows who he is but learning how to be yeah, learning how to work beside each other efficiently and and also like be a friend at the same time. It it takes it takes time. What's that been like for you? Kind of the same. I mean, what you're saying about kind of being in a position of authority but also having to learn from those people like you the way you described what you did like it make you made it sound pretty easy, but that is not an easy thing to do and like you really had to put any ego aside and be like, Hey, listen, I don't know anything. And that, that is really, really hard to do. And then also maintain friendship. It's super hard to do. Yeah, it's super hard to do. But I I find more and more, like, as I'm in this work, as I'm in ranching, like, the more capable you are of putting your ego aside and really being fully present in a moment or present with a person or with an animal and not getting in your head and letting this like little dialogue go on and really just being where you are like it's going to give back to you if you can if you can do the work of exiting your ego and just like being with the person with the place whatever it is 
it'll give back to you. That was definitely a big theme for me when all my cows were dying, <laughs> like being present, like being present because I would be able to like, if I literally just like, you know, just became one with what I was trying to see in my herd, I could see sickness so much better. Like I could see you had to like exit out of the worry of it, exit out of the, all the, all the feeling of it and just like be there. And you could save their lives if you did that. And I ended, you know, I got really, Natalie, you mentioned that you, you, you don't feel like you're very good at health checks. I feel like I got really good at health checks because I had to watch so many of them pass. It was so hard. And so I learned how to like, okay, I got to just figure out how to do this really well and get to know what what's healthy and what isn't. I feel like I'll, I'll jump in here too. Like, I feel like that was almost like the best possible scenario for you to experience something like that. Like, if, can you imagine if you had bought your own herd and they all died and you were just like, what? did I like, it's me. It's like, it's my bad idea. It's my bad. You know, I went about this and it was such a, it was a cool opportunity because you were, you had other people around you to kind of be like, all right, what happened here? Is this some freak accident or is this something that I did? We did, you know? So that, that, yes. Yeah. And that was, that was a really healthy part of it was that John was able to You know, he was able to check himself and be like, oh, we didn't get some things right with their nutrition. Like the supplement wasn't quite right. Like the balance wasn't quite right. And, you know, and Pete was able to look in on the situation from years of experience and say, oh, we did that wrong. And and so the team, the team helped me like claim responsibility for the situation um, whereas you're right. If it had been just me, I probably wouldn't. Yeah. And you probably would have been like, I'm not cut out for this. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Natalie, do you have any experiences like that where you're like, holy crap, I'm so glad that I'm still working for somebody else. Like this would have been so much harder to digest or to like understand what happened if I hadn't had this team to kind of give me perspective of the longer term. Yeah. Yeah. Bart and Wendy just like have this ability to see things that I don't and like very things that when they point them out, it's like very obvious to me, but I just, I, I guess I just haven't been doing the work long enough or don't know. Ant- I mean, they have this like incredible ability to understand animals. And so I think that's, that's what it is, but I kind of had a similar experience, Susan, but it was just with one cow that like, I definitely had a, like a pretty big role in her death and kind of like coming to terms with that and like talking about it. And when I say talk, I mean crying about it (laughs) Um, with Bart and Wendy who are always like, they all, they always take accountability for things, but, um, and, and they've like taught me to also see like my role in issues too. And we talk about them a lot. And so I honestly, I was just like, Oh, an old cow died, but it's like, no, that's not what happened. And I had a, big role in her death to absorbing that and like talking about it and continuing to talk about it and like going through numbers and like writing down death loss, like continuing to talk about that cow is really hard. But then Bart and Wendy were out of town for a while and there was a heifer that basically after that, it's the same situation. I'm just like, okay, I'm going to watch, I'm going to, I have no choice, but to get better and to take care of these cows and watch for sickness. And so there is this heifer that aborted a calf and then she was kind of like not doing well. So I was just like on, this was pretty soon after that first cow died. And so I was just like on watch, you know, just like really paying attention and contacting vets. And I called Erica Mannix and I called Bill and I called people and I was like, Hey, I'm, this cow is not going to die. And so I did all the things and I took, I took care of her and gave her doctored her multiple times, brought her in, did all the stuff, brought her to the vet and she ended up dying. So it's like, I mean, that almost like, it almost hurt or I don't know. It's just hard. It, it didn't hurt worse, but it's like, even if you do, even when you do pay attention, it's just, yeah, it's just hard. Yeah. I think that's, <clears throat> that's one thing I've, I have to come to terms with over and over. Like the longer I'm in this work, it's really you know, the better you get at it, the easier it is to think that you're in control <laughs> and to think that you're in control of a situation or of a, a group of animals or of a, you know, whatever it is. 
And nature has a way, animals have a way of reminding you one way or another, every now and again, there's just going to be that moment that reminds you that you aren't in control. And it's terrible. (laughs) I hate that feeling. Because yeah, you're right. Like sometimes you do every damn thing you can. Yeah. And then you make those mistakes. And you're like, okay, can cross that one off. I have learned this lesson. And then like a month later, you find like when you're just in the thick of like making that mistake again, or like a similar one, you're like, how did I get here, Natalie? Come on. (laughs) I know. So Susan, can you talk a little bit about what it's like going from the mushy gush, not mushy gushy, but like sunshine and rainbows apprenticeship to just like now working and ranching full time year round, like big girl job? One of the biggest differences. So I worked for Steve Charter when I was I didn't doing my apprenticeship. And I think, you know, the combination of it being Steve, who is one of the more, um, how do I say, Steve is, he's a romantic. He is deeply believes in this work and will till, you know, till the day he dies, he is just, his whole heart and whole soul and mind are in it. And he, he really invited my whole being into it. You know, I just felt so engaged and and inspired and like I felt yeah so there was a there was a certain romance of ranching when I first started out that I was invited into that was so exciting and engaging and I think a lot of apprentices ex- experience that romance stage when you when you get to you know work the cows on the horse and the sun's setting and it's beautiful and I mean all the things but but then when you go to this being your day in day at work So, and then when you're in that apprenticeship phase, I guess you hear about, you hear about the hardships of agriculture, you hear about mental, you know, distress, you hear about people that don't have time for their families that are, you know, you, you hear about a lot of those things, but you don't quite, I I never quite grasped it. I never quite grasped like how someone could ever be depressed, like when your work is this, like you get to be outside every day, and it's beautiful, and the birds are singing, and the sun shining, and we're in it, and we're doing work we believe in. I never quite understood, like, wait, why, why do you need time at home? Because like, this work is so fulfilling. And then I come to now where I am in my life and doing this day in day out. And and it's hard. It's hard work. Like the romance wears and the reality sets in and it's it's really hard work. I think that when I was an apprentice, like I really expected like I expected the work to be personally and professionally fulfilling. And I, you know, I just didn't I didn't think I would need like me time because like the work is me time. Like it's all it's all me. Um, but the longer you do the work, the more you realize like it. And and Steve warned me of this because he saw who I was. He saw that I was a romantic like him. And he told me, he said, Susan, this work is going to suck you in. It's going to pull you under if you aren't careful. Um, and it's done that. <laughs> it has. And, and I feel the weight of it now. Like it's hard work. It's mentally trying to and physically trying to bear the weight of the, of the work and of the animal's life, like that, just to bear the weight of these, these lives that we're managing. It's, it's hard. So I don't know, I guess the transition is probably just rosy to real. It, you know, kind of, it's probably not a very, very um, original answer, but I've definitely felt the weight of just kind of the mental weight of, of carrying you know, carrying these animals, carrying this ecosystem and trying to like work with all this life and work with all the death too, and be, be at peace with it when you're the one who's supposed to be the one that makes the difference. Yeah. It's a lot to carry. How does that manifest in your life? Like, how do you manage that at home? And I mean, what, and then what is the future? Like, is it too much or is it just, you have to figure out how to do it to to have a future in this work. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, to, to have a future, I definitely have to learn the balance. I think that a lot of, a lot of my in, I think I've felt imbalanced in this first year because I think I've been trying to prove myself to a new group of people. That's been a big part. Like I really, I really wanted everyone that I was, you know, that I was getting to know in this new workplace to know that I was up to the job, that I could get it done. And so I put, you know, I've put so much into it. And then also, you know, Pete and John will unashamedly claim that they're workaholics. So they're the, you know, they're the people in front of me that are setting an example at this workplace of being at work, dawn to dusk, you know, just getting it done. I think that, you know, I think that for me to have a future in it, for sure, like there has to be more of a balance. And that's something John and I are talking about a lot of how do we get there? And the business is very young. So I think that there's a lot of decisions to be made to help, you know, find that balance. It's just a matter of making them. And it's, it's probably a a step, just a step closer to finding the balance, just to have the conversation. But but then you got to set the boundaries. It's, it's hard work to do when, you know, your work is keeping things alive <laughs> and you don't feel like you get to take a break from that. Like you don't, you don't want to, because it seems like every time you take time for you, something else has to die a little one way or another. And I hate that feeling. Like, I hate that feeling. I don't know. Do you feel that way about like taking time for you? I did last year was pretty, was a struggle for sure. And I definitely felt that way. Like we have, we had three different breeding groups last August and then like a fourth group of our finishing herd. And so there was like four different herds, like all freaking over this Valley. And I felt like, and then I had, I had some like family obligations one weekend. And I just felt like every time I took like a weekend off or even like uh, didn't check the cows on Sunday, I would just be punished. And I would just, I would spend like the first three days of the week, like getting back to square one. And then it's been, then it's beef delivery time. So I've just been a day like in the beef business and then it's like Thursday and it's like, okay, now I guess I'll get back to where I should have been. So I'm never, ever taking any time off. And I, I hope that that's not the case this year. We're kind of doing things differently and we're bringing on an apprentice to hopefully help manage some of that. But yeah, I definitely felt that I, it is really nice to work for people who have interests other than ranching. Um, I mean, they're also workaholic, Bart and Wendy are workaholics too. And they're just like the most active people ever, but they also like to fish and they like to go on pack trips. And so they, create time to do that and so and then they also encourage me to create time to do that and then also just inherently like ranching in a city in Missoula like you kind of have to do other things because it is kind of this like dual lifestyle where it's like the you know the Missoula life is pulling me kind of but also like I'm ranching so it's it it's it it's starting to make more sense to me. I'm starting to figure it out. But for a while I was like, wait, which what like should I be going on a hike or like no, I shouldn't be going on a hike. I'm rant I should walk and check the cows. So I'm kind I'm figuring out how to balance that better. But but definitely working for people who see value in doing stuff other than ranching is really, really healthy for me. I think one of the healthiest things for me is, you know, Rex, my, my husband is very good at, he, he likes to play. Like he likes, you know, time to go and do our thing. And so I constantly have him inviting me to go, you know, let's go do this. Let's go do that. Let's go. We need, we need to make time for that. And so having, having that, and honestly, if I didn't have him, I would spend much more time just giving over to that work because I'm really bad at, I'm really bad at taking that step back. And so it's super helpful for me to have, to have a partner at home that has, like you're saying, those other interests, those other, you know, life is so much bigger than just what, what our work is. Cause at the end of the day, this is our, it is our work. It is, it is just our work. And I have to remind myself of that, even though 
you know, this work invites a lifestyle. It invites a lot of these like personal things that I value uh, or that I, I want for myself. But it is still, you know, it's just work at the end of the day. The other realization I had that has kind of helped me with this, it's like, I am committed to doing this forever. And so it's like, there can be different phases that I go through. Like my first, or I guess it was my second year at Bill's, I spent like all of my free time training my dog and like my, all of my extracurricular interests were reading dog books and going to the dog trainer and spending it with my dog. And then, you know, last spring it was riding and like getting better at horsey stuff. And then and I kind of like always hard on myself. I'm like, okay, if you're not working, then you need your extracurriculars have to be tied to ranching. Otherwise you're a failure, Natalie. <laughs> oh. And I, I mean, I get that is true to a certain extent, but like if I'm committed to myself, like right now my extracurriculars are trying to like be a better community member in Missoula. And I think that will help me at Oxbow in the long run. Um, and I don't, you know, I haven't really been riding recently, but I think because like, I'm not just looking at this, like, okay, I have eight months to be the best rancher in the world. It's like, okay, right now. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not spending my free time riding, but you know, maybe in a couple of months it, I'll, that'll shift or maybe in a year it'll shift. Like there's just so, there's so much time <laughs> to figure it all out. Okay. My next set of questions is two parts. So what are some hard skills that you're grateful for that you had going into your job? And then what are some soft skills that you're grateful you had going into your job? The hard skill that has come most in handy have has been my stockmanship skills set. Um, learning from Whit Hibbard two years in a row um, made a very big difference. That Quivira, Quivira gave us that opportunity to do those clinics with Whit. And, and then I, I had the opportunity with the educational stipend to go and do um, the instinctive migratory grazing herdsman practices with Ricky and Justin Kramers. And so I got to learn how to do a lot of, a lot of stockmanship off of a horse too with them. And, and so I think that just the stockmanship skill set in general, that has come in handy big time. And then just knowing how to ride a horse has been so handy just, and that, you know, working with Steve, we really, we did a lot of our work on horseback. It was interesting because when I came to this ranch, when I came to 4L, they didn't do hardly any work on horseback, but they had a few like old horses in the lot. They're really open to me using, and one of my job titles technically was at the Wrangler. So I was like supposed to manage the horses, which essentially for John was just like, make sure they're fed and, you know, they could be ridden if we needed to, but they didn't really use them day in, day out. But I, because I had learned how to manage the cows with the horses, it was, it was just like, well, that's what I know how to use. So that's what I'll just do. And John was super open to it. And so we, we started managing the stalkers with the horses and we saw increased weight gain, you know, changing, going from using the ATVs to using horses, just like reduce, probably just reduce stress and better, you know, just the better stockmanship in general. Um, it made it, it made a difference in the herd. So I think, I think the stockmanship would be the, that was the, the best hard skill. Um, and then soft skill. I think just, I don't know, this is kind of general, but just like grit and hardheadedness, like, and patience, learning, just knowing how to like stick it out when things are hard, but also being patient with the process. Cause like you're saying, Natalie, you know, there's a lot of time <laughs> and remembering that at the end of the day and letting things happen on, on cow time. <laughs> cow time. <laughs> cow time. My favorite time. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That, I mean, that's what you brought to 4L grazing is you brought that yeah. decrease in stress and you brought, I mean, bringing horses. That's something you brought to that operation that is like so amazing. Yeah. Well, I like, I like working with horses. So <laughs> yeah, I have definitely progressed in my horsemanship. Still wear, you rocking still my have <laughs> your purple glittery helmet. You better Damn, believe it, girl. Yeah. <laughs> you look so good in that thing. Yeah. I like to forget. <laughs> like, I'm like, 
I'm like feeling comfortable on the horse, you know, I'm like, and I'm picturing what I look like. And then like Bart will take a video and I'm like, God, that is not, that is not equal to what the vision I had in my head, whatever. <laughs> oh, it's, it's a journey for sure. It's so good. Yeah. So good. But the, the stockmanship piece, like, I guess I kind of had the opposite feeling. Um, like I, I guess I am just learning that I, really don't know what low stress stockmanship really is just because Bart and Wendy are like deeply obsessed with it and kind of practice and teach to communicate it at a different level than Bill did. And then I just had a, I just got Nell. Like I didn't even learn how to move cows before I got a dog and had her do it. And I'm like, just walking behind her being like, look at my dog go. (laughs) Um, So that's kind of, I, I don't, I honestly sometimes feel like I brought no stockmanship skills to the table <laughs> other than my, my dog did. Um, but yeah, I feel like I brought a lot of soft skills for sure. Just like passion, like, Hey, I want to do this work and I'll do the work. And I've proven myself that I'll, you know, work, work till the work's done. But, um, and then finding people who kind of take that and can teach me a lot of stuff. So I am, gaining a lot of skills, especially in stockmanship. But as far as hearts, I mean, I guess like tying knots and poly wire and like pounding and posts, those are important skills that I do a lot here. But I guess I just felt like last year was just a lot of like, whoa, you don't know anything, Natalie. Yeah. (laughs) Which is hard. (laughs) Well, that was that was one thing when uh, when John hired me, he he straight up told me he was like, I definitely am not hiring you because you have hard skills. <laughs> and he was like, you have a lot of soft skills. I can tell. And we can work with that. And that was really encouraging as a person just like to hear. And I, I mean, for whoever's listening, you know, come in with passion, come in with grit, come in with like a, a willingness to learn. And like, you can, I don't know, there are definitely, there are definitely people out there um, that they need that a lot more than they need the hard skill of knowing exactly how to do it. And that was super encouraging for me to know that, you know, this was a, it was a professional operation. They knew what they wanted. They knew how to get what they wanted. And they said, we don't want hard skills. And that was exciting to me because I, you know, I had only had a couple years time to like learn the hard skills. And so I wasn't good at a lot. But that's so hard. I mean, that that is so true. And that's really beautiful. But that is also like, hard to put your ego aside and be like, I mean, after two, I mean, the apprenticeship is really intense and we both did it for two years. And at the end, you like, think you're hot shit because there's like the whole cohort and the graduation and you're just like and I mean I know Steve was really supportive and Bill and Dana like thought that I was amazing because they're so supportive and amazing but then it's like oh I'm an idiot I don't know anything you know it's like it's like day one you're like oh my god I don't even know how to cut this freaking bail rat like it's just I, I was an idiot and I hope that like in a year listening to this I'm like oh I was an idiot then and so I just keep keep progressing and get become less and less of an idiot I ask so many questions all the time it's just like you can't I can't afford not to like I don't know I don't know what I'm doing I need your help like whoever you are (laughs) I need your help but honestly like that and and I do hope to look back at myself and be like wow you are such a baby you've grown so much but also I'm just like if I can just maintain that willingness to look stupid <laughs> like I'll go far in life <laughs> we'll both go far in this career <laughs> you should get a purple helmet it helps the purple <laughs> helmet really <laughs> helps with you looking stupid yeah you definitely have to and I like even today I texted Bart like he specifically wanted like an office day and you know I'm like you can do all the work. Don't bother him. He doesn't want to be bothered. You can handle everything on your own. And it, or I guess that's how I felt for a while until we like started communicating more openly. And I, he told me he, he doesn't want that. And I just like, now I just ask him the dumbest questions that like, I know the answer to, but it's like, what, we're all working in this together. You know, it's like, whatever, respond to my texts or don't. 
I'll figure it out, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna share just because I can. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like that's, it's really good to hear too. Like, you know, I feel like a lot of apprentices have no idea if they're cut out for a position like what you guys went and did. And I mean, I don't know if you guys thought you were cut out for the positions that you went and got. Like, I think that's always like, that's a huge question we keep getting is like, what am I even qualified to do after this? Like, I don't even know what kinds of jobs I'm, I'm ready for. And so, but it's kind of, it's kind of good to hear from both of you that like, there is, you don't necessarily show up to the job and like be expected to just be perfect and like come ready made, you know, like there is growth within that position too. So it sounds like those jobs are out there. You just have to find, I think also like a culture in which it's appreciated your soft skills that you are bringing and the willingness to learn. Yeah. It's all about the people who you work for and, and I guess kind of the, the community that you're in. Yeah, I think one of the things that was most helpful for for me coming into my position was that John, my manager, had been an apprentice too. Um, and so he, he was at Round River, which is crazy. I don't know. And then the ranch itself had an apprenticeship program. So there, there was just kind of a culture of being a learner. And it, it was really healthy for me to walk into because I felt open to being the learner that I was being, being in the position where I was still, I was still acquiring a skill set, and, and they, they had been there or they were there. Um, so it was good. Yeah. Natalie, I feel like, I think that's all of your questions. I have one question for you guys, if you don't mind. So we have a lot of apprentices listening. Wait, this is like the first, like people are showing up to their apprenticeships like to today, <laughs> like this week. Um, what, what advice would you have for people who are just fresh on the scene, showing up at their host ranches, like diving into this for the first time? Oh, that's a good question. I, yeah, that is. For me, I would say enjoy the, enjoy the romance of it. Like let it, let it, like let it pull you under, <laughs> like fall in love, like fall in love. And it's okay if you're like starry eyed and it feels unrealistic. It is unrealistic. It's not always going to be that way, but you need that time. I feel like you need that time to really just like enjoy, I don't know, enjoy kind of the airy part of it and just like really looking in and just getting dreamy a little. And it's, it's a good thing. I feel like it carries you. I mean, of course, not all days are that way, but the days that are just like really like, eat them up. They're good. They're good. Oh, I love that. <laughs> That's beautiful. I love that. Yeah, that was well said, Susan. My advice would probably be not the opposite, but like very different advice. Like for me, just figuring out how to like take care of myself throughout the day and like pr having my backpack prepared. And now I have, now I've learned, I've really upped my game. I used to just be like, okay, just bring a cliff bar because if I'm hungry, like I'm in a horrible mood, but now I have like a full cool, like it little igloo cooler. And even today I was telling Bart, I'm like, I think I need to upgrade to like a full size Yeti that I just bring around. But it really is just like, I all, I never go anywhere without my backpack, just like full of water. So like so much water on screen, um, Advil, <laughs> like all, my wallet. And then I, and then I have, I bring like a five course meal. And like, now that I live in Missoula, I, I really like, I'll bring brie cheese and like nice crackers. I'm just like, <laughs> it's ridiculous, but it's like, I don't, I leave the house like first thing and I get back like at night, you know, I, I don't, I don't kind of come back and, and make food. I can't like come back and grab anything. So it's like, I love this work so much, but I need to be fully prepared and take care of myself. And I can't be like hungry, you know, I can't be hungry or thirsty. <laughs> yeah. And then like when you're in an apprenticeship, you're just like, okay, just get through it. Like, it, but you guys are in the long haul. Like this is your lifestyle. So it's like, you better find ways that you can treat yourself and like keep yourself going. And if there's no shame in whatever you need, like I'm with you, but the freaking Brie, like, yeah, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Oh my God. I, I, I ride Wendy's saddle and I like put their, these like huge saddle bags on it. Like we can just be going on like a short move and I like bring <laughs> all this water and snacks in my saddle. Bag. And then Wendy will use the, the saddle like later and be like, Oh my God, this is freaking humiliating. <laughs> 
<laughs> on on that note, I feel like I get I get really scared of like summertime apparel because I don't have nearly enough pockets. Like I only have like shirt pockets and jean pockets and like in the wintertime I have like a whole coat, a vest. I can like I can stuff things. Like I put my sunscreen, my my snack, my whatever. And so I get really anxious when summertime comes around and I don't have enough <laughs> clothing to have enough pockets. And so I like, I've definitely become like the fanny pack girl. Like I, I, got, I cart around a fanny pack in the summertime for sure. That's a good, that's a good yeah. idea. I don't know that it's big enough for your five course meal though, Natalie. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the five course meal is separate. That's like, I bring the full size Yeti cooler and I have the fanny pack. <laughs> You guys, this was fantastic. It was like truly such a delight to watch you two catch up. And I've just, we're obviously so proud of both of you. And it was just so cool to see you guys like doing the thing. And like, we're truly just so happy and that you guys came back to share your experience. That's just such a treat. So thank you just so much for being here today. I really appreciate this conversation. Thanks for the invite. It was fun to chat with y'all. Yeah, thank you so much, Taylor. This was so fun. Thanks again so much to our brave co-host Natalie Berkman and her guest Susan Elder. If you'd like to keep up with Susan, you can find more information about where she works at 4lgrazing.com. That's number 4lgrazing.com. You can also keep up with her on Instagram. You can follow at Feral Ranch, F-E-R-R-E-L-L Ranch, or her personal Instagram is at Susan D-A-L-T. If you're looking for a way to get involved in regenerative agriculture, whether that is through a job, internship, educational event, or conference, you've come to the right place. Kivira Coalition has spent decades building a network within the regenerative agriculture community, and we love to share job, internship, and apprenticeship opportunities with our community through this podcast and our monthly newsletter. You can sign up for that newsletter at kibiracoalition.org slash get enews. Iron Rose Land and Cattle in Colorado's Roaring Fork Valley is hiring a regenerative ranch hand for the summer to assist with cattle and irrigation. This person will ideally start mid-April and have some previous farm or ranch experience. For more information, please check our newsletter or email us at newagrarian at kiviracoalition.org. The National Young Farmers Coalition is growing and hiring multiple positions. You can find all their job ads at www.youngfarmers.org slash jobs. Thank you for listening to Regeneration Rising, podcast production of the Kavira Coalition. We'd like to thank our guests for taking the time to talk with us about their experiences. You can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, and other popular podcast platforms. Become a Patreon supporter by visiting kaviracoalition.org slash podcasts. We'd also like to thank Kavira staff members, Leah Ritchie, Taryn Dixon, Taylor Mulia, Lynn Whitbeck, and Caroline Caldwell for their contributions to producing this podcast. This episode was edited and engineered by Caleb Wenzel-Fisher. Wanderlust, our theme music, was made by Scott Buckley. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the land. Thank you.